So um, thank you very much uh, to everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is our first RP Net webinar on telemedicine for RP screening, uh, being held jointly with the Pakistani Society, uh, Ophthalmology Society. And my co-chairs today are Professor Kel Claire Gilbert and Professor Moyne, and we're really delighted to have a really exceptional panel of global experts for this webinar, who I will introduce in turn um, soon. Um, first, I just wanted to give some background to ROP Net, though, and what led us to have this webinar today. So ROP Net is um, a network of professionals which was established in 2017. Um, it was funded at that time by the Diamond Jubilee Trust, and it had the goal of really dealing with the challenge of the looming third epidemic of ROP, which we can see is beginning to occur across Africa and Asia. Um, with the increasing number of, sort of neonatal intensive care units and increasing survival um, of premature babies. So RP Net formed with this goal of preventing vision loss in premature babies by improving both the coverage, um, the prevention and treatment. And it's been based around a number of principles. Um, these have included South-South partnerships. So we matched institutions in Africa and Asia with other mentor or training institutions that were also initially primarily based around India and South Africa. Uh, and the concept of this was that institutions that were slightly further ahead in the ROP screening um, and treatment program, like their journey and who faced similar challenges, would be able to mentor and support those that were just starting their ROP programs or trying to scale up. Um, another important aspect um, of the principle of the program was this multidisciplinary aspect, which was based around both the neonatology and ophthalmology team working very closely together. And in the first phase um, of ROP Net, there were six institutions, so uh, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. And they were supported by training institutions in four different places in India and also in South Africa. Um, that phase came to a close a number of years ago. And now currently we are restarting ROP Net uh, phase two where we are planning to expand to new members. And we are keen uh, to keep the successful sort of South-South partnerships model and the networks, um, as well as the strong multidisciplinary aspect. But we're also planning now to focus more on telemedicine, on strengthening data collection and monitoring, um, especially integrating with the neonatal data um, systems. Uh, collaborating with Ministry of Health and others for advocacy of ROP international policies. Um, and then finally, also this aspect, which is the sort of ongoing education uh, and webinars which we've, which we've just started. And what we hope is this webinar can be a forum for ongoing uh, both education of our members, but also discussion uh, with each other of the challenges that we're facing and a way of supporting each other and coming up with um, new ideas. Um, I'm just at this point going to draw your attention um, to our ROP Net website that we've just set up. Um, we'll put the link um, in the chat uh, in just a minute. So um, I would encourage you all to um, go and sign up at that website. That will make sure that you're part of our ROP network and you'll hear about further about our webinars and other events um, and any kind of future opportunities. Um, so without further ado at the moment, um, I'm going to go straight to introduce our speakers and the way the session is going to run today is that we're going to have um, approximately 10 minutes each of each speaker that you will have seen. Um, we'll follow that by around five minutes or so of questions for each speaker. Um, you can throughout, uh, as a speaker is talking, um, put your questions into the Q&A box. Afterwards, we can put those questions directly um, to the speakers. If you want to speak directly, you put your hand up, um, use the kind of hand function. Um, and then once we've had all the speakers, we should have around 30 minutes or so for any general questions to the entire panel um, and uh, for any other kind of discussions or questions that you may have. So um, start, we're gonna to start today with uh, Professor Paul Chan. He's the head of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Illinois. He's got extensive experience in telemedicine screening and AI in a number of low um, resource settings, and that's what he'll be discussing today. We're going to follow that by Dr. Mishai Kachago, who's a consultant and vitreoretinal surgeon in Nairobi, Kenya, 
They were one of the countries in our initial ROP net uh, uh, program uh, network, and they'll be talking about their experience in Kenya. That will be followed by Professor Linda Visser, who was also involved in that ROP net, and she they were actually a mentor and training uh, institution for the Kenya team. Um, she'll be talking about their experience in telemedicine in South Africa. Um, then we'll have Professor Anand Vinikar, uh, about talking about his very well known and successful Kidrop program, uh, which they have uh, established in India uh, and their experience there. Uh, and then last but not least, we have Professor Moyne from King Edward Medical College in University of Lahore, um, who are also, of course, as I said, running uh, this webinar is also part of their op Pakistan ophthalmology conference that's occurring right now. And he'll talk about, they were also part of our ROP net and they'll be talking about their experiences uh, and challenges in Pakistan. So as I said, we're gonna start with Professor Chan and with his talk for around 10 minutes, and then we'll take around five minutes or so of questions straight after that. So please do put any questions or comments um, as you go along. So thank you. Hello, uh, thank you so much to the organizers for putting together this symposium. Uh, and also thank you for having me speak to you today on telemedicine screening studies in low resource settings. I'm Paul Chan from the Illinois Eye and Infirmary at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Here are my financial disclosures. Uh, I am a co-founder of Solon Vision, uh, which is a company that is looking to provide resources for screening uh, in resource limited settings. And first and foremost, I want to acknowledge my collaborators uh, from the IROP and GenROP groups, um, especially uh, my international collaborators and also Michael Chang, uh, P. Campbell, J. Shri Kapathi Kramer, Karen Jonas, and many others uh, who have helped uh, with the work that I'm going to present to you today. So when we think about telemedicine, I think it's very important to understand that this is not a new idea. Uh, what's been exciting is that we can practice telemedicine more efficiently now with the new technology that we're seeing, uh, with the resources. Uh, and also, as, as we see economic development, we're seeing that our ability to do telemedicine um, through imaging and so forth uh, has been facilitated. And so you look at this, this is a slide from, from Michael Chang, uh, the practice by telephone back in the 1800s. And you can see the doctor uh, talking to the, the grandmother here and trying to diagnose the child with what's happening just through the simple use of a telephone. And now we have imaging, uh, now we have uh, surgical mentoring. We have a lot of different tools at our disposal. And when we think about ROP, I think that this conversation has evolved tremendously over the past 20 years or so. Uh, and historically, when you think back, uh, there was always this question, well, is telemedicine good enough? Uh, is it good enough to make the diagnosis? And studies in the U.S., studies outside the U.S. internationally um, have shown that it works, right? It's been shown to be reliable in the diagnosis of ROP, uh, accurate, cost-effective, and there are many uh, live telemedicine programs uh, around the world. And I think India is a really great example, and you hear from Anand Vinikar uh, later uh, in, this, in this webinar about Kidrop, and he's done a tremendous job and providing access to care in those communities. Uh, we've worked closely uh, with the, the group at Aravind with Parag Shah, Narendra Venkatapathy on their ROPE SOS program, and myself and Pete Campbell. Um, again, doing an amazing job in providing care to thousands of children uh, using telemedicine methods. And one thing that comes to mind though, and, and the questions that a lot of people ask, well, how do, how do we do this? And uh, can we uh, deploy telemedicine screening in low resource settings, in low middle income countries, um, if there is not enough infrastructure, especially for the internet, uh, to do so? And what I found interesting, at least through the work that I've done uh, through the years, is that internet capacity is, is being built uh, very early uh, as we see economic development in a lot of these countries. You know, similar to diabetic retinopathy, as we see countries have uh, more infrastructure and more wealth, uh, you, you're seeing more diabetic retinopathy. I think you're also seeing uh, more retinopathy prematurity. Um, but there are limitations and there are concerns around this, and it's not a perfect model, uh, but it is, it is happening. 
Um, so as I mentioned, you've seen internet access grow exponentially over the past 20 years. Uh, obviously in middle income countries, you're seeing this happen more, uh, more quickly and in high income countries, obviously. In low income countries, um, there are some limitations and there's less literature uh, in low income countries. Um, but what we're seeing mostly is that as low income countries start to emerge into uh, middle income countries that the, the development of telemedicine becomes much more feasible. Cost also um, has been shown to be uh, an issue, not just in the startup costs of telemedicine programs, um, but overall, we found that these have been more cost effective. And, and time and time again, people have shown that screening for ROP is more cost effective than doing nothing. Um, and we don't wanna have blind children uh, if we don't have the screening uh, abilities in place. Um, there's also a lot of opportunities um, in this space going forward. Uh, the ability to create better data management systems, um, the ability to potentially implement artificial intelligence um, in these communities and in these programs, and also for education in general. Okay, so can you provide telementoring, edu teleeducation, and so forth um, to maintain follow up care, but also to follow up with students uh, who are learning uh, in these programs? Okay, so telemedicine is happening, uh, and we're seeing this happen in low middle income countries, but mostly in, in the middle income countries. So Armenia is a great example of what started to happen. And, and this is a program that I worked with uh, Tom Lee on um, many, many years ago. Uh, but th you can see here, you know, you start to see NICU development, NICUs uh, start to uh, keep kids alive. Um, and you're starting to see more premature babies, which subsequently means that you're gonna see children who are at risk for retinopathy prematurity. And if you don't have screening programs in place, these children will get discharged and they'll go blind if they are at risk for a development treatment prior disease. Okay, so you need to find solutions. And one solution is telemedicine uh, if you don't have enough of a workforce, especially uh, to screen all of these kids at bedside. And then also for the follow-up care as they come to your outpatient clinics. But using image-based um, diagnosis and, and care, I think is very helpful, especially for identifying children at high risk. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, the folks at Aravind uh, in Quambator have done a really terrific job at uh, providing care for these children uh, in the ROPE SOS. This is a USAID sponsored program. Uh, you can see here they have a van and uh, they have a, a red cam shuttle and other imaging devices that they've, they've used over the years. And you can see the large area that they cover uh, here in India uh, to go out to the communities, screen them, uh, provide diagnosis by physicians in Quambator, um, and then provide appropriate treatment accordingly. Uh, again, this hub and spoke model, I think is, is very, very effective in many parts of the world. And as I mentioned also, uh, and Dr. Bernicar will uh, discuss some of the work that he's done with KidRob. Um, other uh, programs that we've been involved in is a program with Orbis International. Uh, so we've we published on this screening program that we implemented in Mongolia. Again, prior to the work, uh, there were no screening programs in place at that time. Uh, but then we started to see children who had developed uh, very severe ROP who required treatment. Um, and with uh, Tsenge Chilampat and with um, Chimja uh, Chilampat, the, the folks there have developed really strong screening programs using image-based diagnosis, uh, deploying telemedicine methods, um, and also telementoring. Um, this is now continuing uh, to a next phase uh, with Orbis International, looking at uh, AI and so forth and how feasible that is in these communities. Um, but again, uh, using image-based, not just for screening children, but also for education and training. Okay, so one of the other things that came out of this program is also the, the need for really good data management systems uh, to standardize data uh, so that we can understand better uh, who are at risk for developing ROP and treatment requiring ROP and to also improve the care overall for the children uh, with, who were born prematurely. We've also worked uh, with programs in Nepal at Tikanga Eye Institute uh, in, co in uh, collaboration with uh, Forest and also Helen Kelly International. Uh, here, different from using the RECAM, uh, they used a uh, more cost-effective camera using the Forest. Um, 
and you can see here Dr. Samyam Bajamaya from Nepal uh, training and uh, using that forest system and the folks here from Helen Keller. And what was great about this program is that they, they were using data management systems, a, a system that we developed called Itelligent uh, to try to not just collect data on the eye findings, but also on the systemic findings uh, of these children. Um, and then a lot of advocacy uh, was done for these children in promoting uh, better screening programs. And you can see here uh, on the right, the uh, data collection system from the forest. And what's neat about this is that over the, the past decade, uh, they've really done a great job in improving their cloud-based uh, management system, telemedicine reading center. Uh, and this was the, the, the system that we were using initially. Um, and the left is our, our reading center, Itelligen, which has been used by the Aravind Eye system um, for all of their screenings over the past uh, three to five years or so, uh, looking at thousands of children. Um, so I think that this is a very important piece of, of the discussion uh, when we think about establishing these telemedicine systems, especially in low resource settings, is that not only do we want to make sure that we're doing a good job with the screening and the imaging, but also data collection so that we can learn better who are at risk um, and to have discussions in these critical conversations with neonatology about how we can improve the care of these children overall. Um, obviously, internet speeds matter and can affect the care uh, and also uh, of data collection in general. Um, significant uh, coordination between everyone involved uh, has to be done right, to make sure that there's good coordination and follow-up. Another topic that comes to mind when we think about telemedicine is the training, right? So we can implement systems, we can get cameras, we can have the, the workforce uh, and, and, and get people to actually operationalize the telemedicine system, but we can't forget about how important it is to make sure that the people doing the diagnosis are trained well and can understand uh, the critical features of the disease, but also make sure that follow-up and treatment is performed. Um, we've subscribed to the establishment of teleeducation systems that we've built, uh, not just internally, but also with in, in partnership with the American Academy of Ophthalmology and others. Um, we've shown that And as I mentioned, we've established um, teaching programs through the American Academy of Ophthalmology uh, to provide an open access way that people can look at or, or train on the basic uh, diagnostic changes um, in ROP. Uh, you can also think about using imaging to train people how to treat, right? We've published papers doing this, uh, looking at can you use a red cam to identify skip areas and so forth. And we found that it can be very useful uh, as compared to just using indirect ophthalmoscopy. Also training people uh, on doing the imaging. You know, this is very, very important. So when we establish these telemedicine systems, making sure you have good imagers to go in country and to teach a workforce and how to do appropriate imaging in general. And very importantly, we all know this, indirect ophthalmoscopy still matters because we have to use indirect ophthalmoscopy uh, to apply appropriate laser treatment for these patients and also when to do anti-VEGF injections um, and how to follow these patients appropriately. So in summary, uh, telemedicine screening uh, is happening in low resource settings um, and I think more so uh, in middle income countries. Uh, but very importantly, and you see here at the top, there's more to ROP telemedicine screening than just reading an image. And I think that's something that we all have to think about. Um, there are a number of challenges in image-based diagnosis. Um, there's some variability in training for ROP care. So focusing on, on education, I think is critical. Um, Telementoring can be done. Uh, data management, incredibly important. Uh, as we look to the future um, and collaborate together. Uh, so making sure that we're using good systems and all agreeing on what should be established, not just for the eye findings, but also for the neonatal findings and, and, and how people are doing systemically. And I think importantly, one of the questions that comes up too is who should be responsible for, responsible for ROP screening? And I still believe that it should be the skilled ophthalmologist um, who determines the management decisions for ROP especially in, uh, in these cases. So I think the future is exciting as we start starting to see uh, better technology, more cost-effective technology, 
and really a team approach uh, coming together to care for these children on a global scale. So again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you very much. And thank you, Paul, and I think Paul has also joined us now. So um, thank you for being hey, here. Hey, Aisha, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that. It was really, um, I mean, it's an amazing, great presentation, but also like the amazing the kind of the experience that you've got. Um, I was, I'm just going to wait and see if there's any other questions that come up. But one question I had was just about, because you've got the experience of seeing things across India, uh, Mongolia and Nepal, like just, I don't, I, thinking about what are the kind of main, I suppose, differences and the, and the challenges that you face in these sort of different settings in terms of implementation and um, and the telemedicine uh, screening in those kind of different places, I guess with a view of thinking about what are the challenges for people in general when they're first starting that they're more kind of can, to be aware of and plan for. Is there something that yeah. works on? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And, and Aisha, I think you and, and so many and everyone here on the, in the group have heard this a lot, which is how can they make it work so well in India, right? And we face all these interesting challenges elsewhere uh, to implement these large scale screening programs. Um, I think even in the U.S., you know, we face a lot of challenges around how do we just get this off the ground? How do we get buy-in? Um, I'd love to get Anand's take on this, too. I mean, we've spoken to Prague about this in Aravind, um, but just getting the, the, the folks to do the imaging, to set up the programs, um, you know, in this hub and spoke model, I think is very challenging, right? And you kind of have to get buy-in. So the... So there are common themes, right? Which is you need to get buy-in from everyone involved in the care of the child, right? So you need neonatology 100% on board. Um, you need to have the infrastructure from the hospital to make sure that you have the personnel who are going to do the imaging and help you with the workflows. You need the technology, right? And I think that that's another uh, sort of bottleneck that we face is that there are so many systems out there, but not everything is perfect, right? And it's very cost prohibitive. Um, and then you need the platforms, right? And, and that's why we kind of focused on the data management and telemedicine screening part. Um, but I think it's one thing you learn, and, and you know this just as well as I do, is that if you've implemented in one place, you've imp implemented in one place, and if you've seen one system, you've seen one system. Um, so it's, it's not as easy as it seems. Right, and we know this, um, but we have to do it. And it's just one of the things I, I will say that I think we're going to have to also figure out as a community are the, um, and, and this goes to the the question that's in the Q and A, uh, one of the the earlier questions around what would you do? Would you do screening first in person? Would you start with telemedicine? Even in the United States, we face the similar challenges, and we have, you know, at least in in, in our in our world. Um, you know, the American Account of Ophthalmology and OMIC, which is an insurer, you know, comes up with these guidelines around what people should be doing. Um, so it'd be really interesting discussion in the global community, uh, sort of recommending best practices as we start to implement programs, right? Um, and that's something that people can lean on. Yeah. So Aisha, I don't know if they answer your question, but, you know, every program that I've worked with is different and faces similar but also different challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're going to hear from Mushai next and then Linda, and I think they will, mm -hmm. part of what they're going to talk about is some of the challenges of trying to do telling, like doing it in their setting and what they've come across. Um, yeah. So I think then maybe like at the end when we can discuss together, we can we can have a think more about that kind of a deeper. Um, I've got like a kind of another question, which I don't know if you're like just from the audience about what other cadres could be involved and I think you touched on that a bit um but yeah just what other kind of people could be involved in RP screening and I know that again you've seen that in different settings who, who else could be trained for yep yeah and I, and I think that this is again you know in in the U.S. you know we we are very clear about the ophthalmologist doing the screening and being responsible for the training pro for the screening programs Again, that's going to be different everywhere we go around the world, right? And I think it, it really depends on 
who we are comfortable with or who is approved for certain types of care for, for, for our patients. Right. And, you know, I'm not going to pretend like I know, you know, what's happening in every, every part of the world, but, you know, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, non-ophthalmologists can care for uh, patients with cataract surgery and so forth. Right. We know this. Um, so again, this is going to be the, the discussion around who is competent, right. To do so and who within your, uh, environment and within your country is accredited appropriately to do so. I think that's another issue is that accreditation will matter and we have to make sure that the ophthalmologists are in that discussion on who should be doing this, right? Because um, you are ultimately going to be the one responsible for the treatment and the the long-term management of, you know, of these children. And I'm, I'm actually curious, Aisha, what, from the, there, and there's so many people in this room that are really great and have thought about this. I mean, that's a really great question, right? This is a scope of practice issue. What do you think? Who should who should be allowed to? Yeah. I was just going to say, I think this is actually a question for all because, um, and I'm just going to talk about, of course, like they've trained other cadres in India, but then I think there's been, um, I think, again, Linda, they've had issues with like, uh, um, legal um, cases and things like that in South Africa. So all of that, I think you have mm-hmm. to balance up, as you said, ultimately the responsibility then, who, who bears the responsibility for a baby if they were to go blind from ROP. And I guess that, you know, so that that person who bears that responsibility has to kind of be overseeing whoever else is uh, conducting the screening and all of that as well. So I think that's an important, important question, which can, as you said, run differently in, in different countries. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, Linda, I mean, that, that's, you know, we, we, we always consider the, the medical legal issues around this because, you know, that's ultimately the, the onus is going to be on the ophthalmologist, I think, um, and also neonatology. Um, Mohammed put in a, something about AI. That, yeah. Do we have a few hours to talk about that one? <laughs> I, know. I saw that question and I was actually going to subtly put that for the panel discussion at the end. Because <laughs> I want us yeah. to on to it. But I think that question about AI with telemedicine, um, if yeah. <laughs> that's the point, we maybe we can put that question at the end of the for the because there's going to be like a kind of a, a round discussion which we'll do after all the speakers. Um is that if that's okay, Professor Moy? <laughs> then what to me on to on to uh uh Dr. Kachago's presentation and he's here and he's also going to be around for some specific questions and I do like I think these will be quite interesting now what we're coming up with next we're going to have the example from Kenya um case studies from Kenya and then uh, South Africa so maybe if we if that's okay I'll move on to that thank you Paul thank sure, you thanks. for the presentation and, and I hope you can yeah stay and join us for the end for the panel uh is there anything else you wanted to add Moin at this stage Uh, sorry, thank you very much. I think Paul uh, did a very wonderful talk. I think it's commendable that he's doing so much for so much, and uh, I don't know whether he gets that energy to do that. So <laughs> we're trying to start that kind of a stuff. But I think this is the future, and it's he has realized that very very early, and he's uh, getting everybody onto it. I think I think this is the way to go now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Maureen. All right, so we'll go on to the next speaker, which is Dr. Kachaga from Kenya. We'll just run a presentation first. And then again, everyone can just put any questions for him into um, the chat box. We're actually also going to be running a few other questions as we go along. So please just notice if there's any things about whether you're practicing RP screening and whether you're doing treatment. Um, it's just very good to hear a bit more from um, the people who are joining us as well. So um, just be aware of any questions pop up in your chat to answer those as you go along as well. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Mushaga Shago. I'm an ophthalmologist and retina specialist from Nairobi, Kenya. And <clears throat> I'll be talking a little bit about telemedicine in Kenya in the ROP setting. Uh, these are some of my affiliations. The ROP journey in Kenya started 
in earnest at around 2015. This is when we really got down to organized ROP screening. The pilot program was set up at the Kenyatta National Hospital, which is a tertiary referral hospital in Nairobi, Kenya. The pilot at Kenyatta National Hospital in partnership with the University of Nairobi was selected as a best site because it had a large NBU or NICU with a capacity of about 100 patients. Occupancy at the hospital was at about 150 to 200, however. With time, improved neonatal care had become available and therefore smaller babies were surviving. Oxygen monitoring, however, was very poor and therefore we suspected that there would be very high prevalence rates of ROP. The expertise was also present. We had neonatologists, retroretinal surgeons, pediatric ophthalmologists, both from the Kenyatta National Hospital and the University of Nairobi. ROP also fit the criteria for screening. ROP as a screenable disease qualifies much because it is site threatening, serious and irreversible consequences occur if not treated early, treatment at earlier stages is more effective than after the development of symptoms, high prevalence of the detectable preclinical phase, there are also suitable screening tests available which have high sensitivity, specificity, are of adequately low cost, easy, safe, have minimal discomfort and are generally acceptable. There's also appropriate and available follow-up. At the time of starting our research program, there wasn't much in terms of research that had gone into ROP. There was the Wanjala study of 2003 and 2004, where he had assessed 120 babies, 240 eyes in a public urban hospital. ROP prevalence at the time was established to be about 16.7%, with 0.8% of babies having threshold of eyes having threshold ROP. There was a study by Statin in Western Kenya, which was a rural setting, and there wasn't any severe, there was no ROP that was detected in this study. Onyango study of 2015 is what shed quite a bit of light on ROP status in private hospitals in Kenya. 120, 102 babies were studied in a private urban hospital, and ROP prevalence was noted to be as high as 42%. They also noted that the babies were much smaller in surviving at 1.1 kilos with a mean gestational age of about 29 weeks. The beginnings of the program were difficult and there were a lot of naysayers. We had very poor equipment. The laser had dodgy optics and a broken fiber optic cable. A 28D lens was just not available and I had to buy my own. Pediatric speculum was also not available and my colleague and I had to buy some and donate them to the program. We got a donation of a vasting to the university that was able to be used for the ROP babies. The ROP drops were also donated. However, the supply was erratic. We developed some standardized documents that we would use to capture the information. This was in the form of forms and registers. The first full year of ROP screening was 2016, and in that year we managed to screen 183 babies and diagnosed 18 cases of ROP. This was at about 10% of the MCM. We then decided to escalate the screening to a national level, and this needed some organization. And therefore, we formed what was called the National Retinopathy of Prematurity Working Group, looked in some of some neonatologists to join into the working group, and got stakeholders involved through various meetings. This was the ROP working group that was established on the 25th of June 2017. And in it, we had three pediatric ophthalmologists, two vitreoretinal surgeons, and four neonatologists. And you note that the neonatologists were more than the ophthalmologists because they are the primary caregivers to these little babies. So with that program, with the um, working group set up, we were able to extend training and ROP services to more hospitals. And the public hospitals within the screening program are now up to six. The Kenyatta Hosp National Hospital, Mama Lucy Hospital, Mwani, Bagazi, Mugwanga, and Moi Teaching and Referral Hospitals. We have also increased the screening programs available in private hospitals. And now these are up to nine private hospitals. The Nairobi Hospital, the Kami University Hospital, 
Coptic Missional Stronger of the South of Pronata, Empisha Avenue, Metropolitan, and Medi Health. We have also identified the next few sites that we shall go out to train. These are the Kembu Level 5 Hospital, Pika Level 5 Hospital, and the Jeremogu Ringa Referral and Teaching Hospital in Kisumu. These are very large hospitals with very high volumes of patients, including neonates. And we have actually seen cases of ROP coming from some of these setups and sometimes, unfortunately, rather late. So what is the role of telemedicine in our setup? Because we realize that telemedicine is the ability to deliver healthcare services remotely. And I think this would apply to ROP because we have the opportunity to gather images and share them. So telemedicine would here would be the form of photo documentation of cases through photography, peer-to-peer -peer consultation aided by these images, patient-to-doctor consultation, remote imaging and lab works, remote monitoring. In our setup, with the expanding network of institutions now offering ROP, we feel there could be more of a need of telemedicine now than there ever has been in the past. Redcam in our setting, we have a Redcam, but unfortunately, it has not been used much in the screening of ROP, but has been used largely in the documentation of retinoblastoma. Um, so we haven't done much with the Redcam in ROP screening. What we have made use of more is a 2.2 or 20 diopter lens together with a Thanos photograph. Some papers have been written about it, as you can see, showing that it is an effective way an effective and actually very affordable way of capturing images using a phone. And these images are therefore then very easy to share and learn from. Sometimes the apps on the phone don't work well and we have found that there's an app called the VF Lite that works quite well because it is able to have the flashlight running on your phone as you search for that good image that you want to capture. These are some of the images that we have been able to capture with a 20D lens and a smartphone. Photos are courtesy of Dr. Oscar Nyango, who is a member of the ROP working group, and we call him the father of, of ROP in Kenya. The stage four disease, as you can see in this case, with a retinal detachment, very well documented with a 20D lens. Here you have other stages of ROP, earlier stages where you can see the abnormal vasculature, and a normal demarcation line there, a couple of liver spots here, small hemorrhage right there. In this case, we see very aggressive plus disease all the way to the posterior pole. In this case, you see abnormal vasculature forming the periphery of the retina. Here you see very nice images of laser marks that have been delivered to the child. And you can also see here a nice features hemorrhage right there. And here you also see abnormal vasculature going towards the periphery of the retina with an abnormal demarcation line right there. So in summary, with scaling of screening, there will be more need for organized telemedicine to assist with knowledge sharing, documentation, better demonstration to parents, teleconsulting in, 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 in on remote cases, monitoring of disease progress, and development also of an ROP database that could be assisted with the recognition of high quality images that can then be stored. Thank you very much. And I look forward to listening to the rest of your presentations and learning how better we in Kenya can adopt telemedicine in the fight against ROP. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mishai. I think Mishai, you used to have just gone off. <laughs> it was actually on here in the panel. So the really interesting uh, presentation from Shai. I don't know if there's any questions or comments um, for him at the moment. Is there anything, uh, Professor Moyne, from your from your side and actually the people um, in back then who are watching as well? Oh, hold on, Michelle, it's coming back on. Hello. Hi, Michelle, we're just looking for you. Hi, sorry, I it just dropped off the call immediately, the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed that. I thought I'd seen him throughout, and then just as soon as his presentation finished, <laughs> he dropped off. 
<laughs> but it was a great presentation and thank you for uh thank you for sharing it with us um i, I was just i mean i was thinking i i don't know i'm just gonna have a look and see if there's any other questions but i had uh, just a couple um oh actually more so professor Moyes asked one uh let me just read out the comments first actually before i go to mine so marcia has written um congratulations shy sarah oscar and the team in kenya wow <laughs> you have really moved forward with your network into kenya and in such a short time so interesting to see your learning with the smartphone too well done and keep up the amazing work so that's just a very nice comment from marcia um and then professor moyne is is phone-based screening as good as a record? And is it possible to decide where it is if you stop breathing? I think you probably know the answers to those questions. I think at the moment it's yeah. Um, uh, we know that, like at the moment I think that's no, not the case using images from an iPhone. So I think um, Professor Moyne just wanting to know, I guess, more about the smartphone based, um, the phone based screening that you're doing and how you know how you found that working and how you find those images compare and. Do they, do they help you? Are they really able to help you with your decision making? Yeah, thank you for that question. The phone based screening works in terms of, especially when you need to get posterior, you know, posterior photos, it works quite well because it's not as wide a field, of course, as the red cam. So when you need to get more peripheral photos, then it requires a little maneuvering in terms of turning the baby's eye with a tiny kind of uh, indenter or using a vectis loop. We found that it's quite small and gentle for the baby's eye with a speculum in place. So you have to do that to kind of see more peripheral disease. So in terms of screening, personally, I'll take the photos for photo documentation and in case I feel like I need to share them, but I will always do an indirect fundoscopy along with that so that I have a better view, I have a wider view and can therefore make a better decision. So we do the fundus photo kind of to augment, um, indirect fundoscopy yeah. and to enable us to share and also do presentations in the course of teaching or for photo consultation. And how did you learn to do it actually? Did you, how have you taught yourself? Does it teach yourselves? Are you teaching each other? How's that going? Because I've, I've given it a go at the odd time and it's not easy to do. Exactly. <laughs> to do. Yeah. <laughs> It, it is not something you can be taught. It's like indirect fundoscopy. You keep doing it until you get it. That's the trick. So it helps to watch somebody do it because you find the image they share with you is often not as great because once you get the image, you get a, you know, get part of your fingers, you get, you know, some of the baby's face. So once you've done your photo, you then have to kind of crop it. And what you share with people is a nice clean image that they think you've got. So you kind of just have to play around with it if you have the opportunity of using the monocular indirect, then it's a bit easier because you've had that experience of 20D and monocular indirect of thermoscope. But if you're just used to the indirect, then it takes a little more training, knowing where to position the lens and where to position the phone for your best quality image. But basically, you will place your phone where your face normally is when you're doing an indirect endoscopy, and then just keep playing with it. An easy way to do it is with a video function. Because as you do a video function, then you can see what's happening. So try play around with the video function because the flash is on until you're able to get good images. Then pause and crop, you know, like I get a screenshot. That's one way of doing it. But with time, like with the VF light app, it activates a camera even when you're doing a photo. So you have a nice viewfinder, so to speak, until you get the photo that you want and then snap it. So those are, you know, tricks that you can use in the course of learning how to use the indirect. These days, there are some commercially available kind of lens holders, like the, they call it a red cam. What do they call it? Something like a mini red cam or something. It's basically, a, it's like a bar which holds your phone on one end and the lens on the other end with a preset distance. And therefore you get good photos all the time. So that's also a gadget you can use that is quite uh, cost effective, so to speak. And how often do you actually practically use it? Do you have people like, for example, do you have like, um junior ophthalmologist or whatever in, in another hospital doing screening will they actually send you these as a for advice and do you feel like you can give clinical advice based on those images well the challenge right now is what you're talking about it is it is more difficult to get a photo with the app than it is to see the retina with your indirect yeah. so most of the consults i will get is people who have actually just looked and then call me and describe what they have found but on occasion i have found that their description and what i actually see when i finally get to it are quite different 
And therefore, yeah. as we roll out the kind of the screening, that's one of the skills we want to incorporate into the training to enable better communication. Because getting red comes at the peripheral hospitals, as of now, still looks like a pipe dream because of the restrictive cost. But you know, there are cheaper options from India that we could also look into. But for now, the most you know affordable option is try to get images with a smartphone and a 2.2 or 20D. Yeah. And I think, I mean, how far do you think you are from, or what do you think else needs to be put into place before you start, like, I suppose, a very kind of set up telemedicine screen program using, like, one of these other imaging devices, like the Forest or the other ones that we know of? Yeah, well, at, you see, at the Kenyatta Hospital, there actually is a retcom, but it kind of came through the retinoblastoma program. So yeah. it's been used for retinoblastoma all along and not really much for ROP because the ROP is a little bit more movement with moving it, shuttling it to the NBU, baby to baby. And so it hasn't really caught on, but it is there. We have had one of the Indian cameras for Fundus camera, not for ROP screening. We don't have the hand gadget. So I think it's with more kind of lobbying because right now, even the expansion of the ROP program has suffered because of funding. So we're in the process of trying to get some funding to kind of do more training for the peripheral facilities because we find that is kind of a lower fruit than investing so much money to one machine in one institution. Uh, so the next step might be to get a shared, more affordable red cam that can be used to screen a couple of institutions. And so that's a kind of funding we are kind of following up through now with the retinopathy of prematurity working group, which runs yeah. internationally. Yeah, and there are more and more lower cost cameras and we can talk a bit about that later on. And I think, but maybe I think the initial thing is that in the beginning there is a kind of an increased time, you know, like people need to be trained to do telemedicine screening. And if you're used to doing it a certain way within direct, then again, there's a sort of a, a time of learning and then training others and all of that. So there's quite a lot of uh, initial investment, not just in finances, so yeah. also in, in time of the people who are actually doing it. So that can also be quite a challenge. Um, is, there, is there any other questions from the panelists or from the team in Pakistan? I can see actually Anand has put something in the in the in the chat. He said Anand has written the fixed stand device that Dr. Mushai spoke about. There are two in India: the My Retcam, it's a MWI Retcam, and C3, and they use your native phone in a fixed distance to the 20 D at the end. They're good for photo documentation, but not good for peripheral field. Um, and for he's also answered Dr. Moyne's question: image is good enough to discharge a baby. Yes, if you can image the aura, and he says this is possible on the RETCAM in the Forest Neo, and we have publications images on the aura in the Neo. Yeah, and I think Anand will talk about that in his talk as well. So yeah, if you can, obviously, if you can image up to the aura, then you're able to uh, make clinical decisions. Okay, thank you very much, Mishai. Uh, it's really great to have you. Um, please do stay to the end for our kind of general discussion and panel discussion, um, and I will... Um, uh, yeah, we're going to move on to now just hearing from Linda. So thank you, Michelle, and we'll speak to you again soon. Um, is there anything else, uh, Professor Moyne and Gilbert, did you want to add and ask just now? Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, we've now next got um, Professor Linda Visser, and she's going to be talking about their experience in South Africa. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on ROP teleophthalmology screening, the South African experience. We all know that improved neonatal care in middle income countries has led to a third epidemic of retinopathy of prematurity, and South Africa has not been spared this. Without concomitant improvement in ROP screening, ROP associated visual loss will remain a challenge. Teleophthalmology screening programs and artificial intelligence technologies might be the key to address unmet demand in ROP screening. But the question is, has there been a move towards teleophthalmology screening for ROP in South Africa? I've been chatting to my colleagues about this question and the short answer is no. Reasons for this need further research but there may be different reasons depending on where one practices, whether it be in the private sector or insured sector or the public sector, which is uninsured. And if you are in the private sector, whether you are working in a city or a rural setting, 
and if you are in the state, whether you're in an academic or non-academic setting. South Africa has a bin binary type of health system, private South African healthcare, as well as academic public healthcare, equal that of most developed eco economies healthcare. But the non-academic public healthcare system tends to lag behind. In South Africa, the current screening guidelines are those of the national guidelines of 2013. These mandate screening for infants with a gestational age of less than 32 weeks or a birth weight of less than 1,500 grams. These are absolute uh, criteria. But infants with birth weight between 1,500 and 2,000 grams should also be screened at the discretion of a neonatologist um, based on other pathologies and especially if the unbleded oxygen supplementation was administered to these infants. These guidelines are now 10 years old and are under revision and new guidelines should be available from next year. And we plan to um, decrease the uh, birth weight uh, in the absolute criteria to 1,250 grams. Some provinces have already lowered this uh, acute screening criteria to a birth weight of less than 250 grams. And in the private sector, this has been ongoing for a while. So how does it differ between the public and the private sector when it comes to screening? Well, in the public sector, the numbers are large. Uh, babies are generally admitted to either regional or tertiary facilities in large centers. This is different from about 20 years ago where decentralization had taken place and the healthy bigger babies had been sent to the district area units and had been put on 100% uh, oxygen by nasal prongs and not screened at all for retinopathy of prematurity. At that point, we had a large number of big babies developing ROP and going blind and was followed by a lot of medical legal action. And that has meant now that all premature babies are kept either at regional or tertiary level until they've been screened at least once before they are decentralized. And we are definitely seeing a lot less ROP since this has happened. Screening in the state facility or public sector is done by medical officers or registrars. Uh, these are junior staff, not, not uh, consultant pediatric ophthalmologists, but they're really good at doing the screening. They usually do about 30 babies in a morning um, with using indirect ophthalmoscopy. Most academic units, or at least five of them in the country, have uh, red cam facilities or equivalent contact wild, wide field um, digital retinal imaging. This is, however, not used to do screening. These machines are typically used to um, monitor progress in type 2 ROP or to document changes that occur pre and post treatment for medical legal purposes. In the private sector, the number of babies are a lot smaller, but the number of hospitals where screening needs to be done are quite much more. Um, these are units that are sometimes in larger private hospitals, but sometimes in small private hospitals where only one or two children uh, need to be screened per week. The screening is done by a pediatric ophthalmologist, so much more senior people. And again, most of them use indirect ophthalmoscopy to do the screening. The problem is that the number of doctors prepared to do the screening, the number of pediatric ophthalmologists prepared to screen is fast dwindling for two main reasons. One is that they have to pay an increased malpractice insurance levy. So those people who um, are doing screening are, are um, given a higher levy to pay. And this is largely because of previous medical legal claims. This is, however, unfair because the, the people doing the screening are generally not uh, the ones who are uh, sued as rather the neonatologists, but still the medical um, protection society have decided in South Africa that the screeners will also be penalized. The 
other factor is that the screening is actually quite time consuming. The ophthalmologist needs to drive to various uh, units. It's time, wait, time in, in the car, it's fuel. The process is a long process to get to various uh, hospitals. Sometimes the babies are not dilated and they waste their time. And the remuneration for ROP screening in South Africa in the private sector is actually quite atrocious. It's almost nothing. So most pediatric ophthalmologists doing ROP screening in South Africa in the private sector are actually not getting paid for it. In fact, they are paying to do the screening. And for this reason, a lot have now stopped doing screening. And the dwindling number is a problem um, because some of the new national units are now having to purchase um, cameras. And that's happened recently in Cape Town. The first private unit to get a, a, a camera in South Africa and start doing um, teleophthalmology ROP screening. I spoke to the specific doctor who's involved and she's quite unhappy. She says at least 50% of the images are actually quite poor quality and she still needs to actually go and see these babies most of the time. So this is just to point out where the facilities are that we are doing screening. So um, the provinces that are colored in Red, um, KwaZulu Natal, um, Gauteng Province, and the Western Cape are the provinces that have currently probably the, the better health care, the, the more private care, and, and most of the academic units are in those three provinces. The other provinces um, are still going through um, the third epidemic. Uh, some cases are still coming from those provinces, but they definitely also have learned from the province of KwaZulu Natal, which in the past was where most of the uh, stage five ROP was seen, and most have learned from that and are managing these babies a lot better. But the new natal services in the, in the other nine, uh, six provinces are still not quite up to scratch. So the um, the diamonds denote where the uh, red cams are, the large diamonds, and the smaller ones are where the ROP uh, screening can take place in secondary units as well. Uh, generally in South Africa, teleophthalmology is commonly utilized, especially in Cape Town where I am, um, but also other parts of South Africa. Most referrals come to us via GPs, optometrists, or our colleagues in the hospital via um, an app called Rula, and patients are referred with a short history and usually a photograph of, of sorts. Diagnostic procedures for eye diseases rely on clinical assessment and image capturing de devices like fields and fundus photography. And these we know are well suited to deep le learning techniques. And because of that, uh, a lot of the glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy screening currently is performed by teleophthalmology with uh, more and more commonly uh, artificial intelligence grading becoming uh, available. Even with other teleophthalmology screening, such as glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy, there's still some barriers, such as poor quality images, and uh, these can be patient-related, these can be technician-related. But there's also other problems in, in developing countries, like internet speed, bandwidth. If you want a really good quality fundus photo, you need to have quite a large bandwidth to send uh, big files. The equipment is expensive, specifically in the case of ROP screening. Red cams are atrociously expensive in South Africa. But even OCT machines, fundus cameras, etc., these can be quite expensive. Then employing and training your additional staff to be technicians to do good quality uh, images. In South Africa, we have something called load shedding, where electricity is cut off to certain areas to... Um, to decrease the burden on the on the grid and therefore one needs to install uninterrupted power supplies and that can also be costly and then obviously as with everywhere else in the world security and confidentiality of patient data 
uh, will always remain a concern. But largely, uh, many of these barriers are cost-related. In the rest of the world, there are currently quite a number of successful ROP teleophthalmology models. And this is from an article by Tan et al. Uh, from last year. And the, the well-known successful models include Artrock in New Zealand, in Auckland, where uh, specialist ROP nurses capture the images and the grading is done by pediatric ophthalmologists. Uh, other the well-known one is at um, um, it's the sun drop screening which is done um, at Stanford where NICU nurses capture images and they're graded by ROP specialists. Uh, in India there are quite a number of these. The kid drop is the most well-known and I'm sure Anand will be talking about this but in the case of kid drop technicians actually capture and grade the images and then there are other well-known ones in Germany, Chile, etc., that were discussed in this article. They do, however, say in the article that there's a, still limitations, even in these successful models, with inadequate quality of images, up to 21% of cases. And they found, especially in infants with dark fundi and small palpable fissures, also, there's a significant initial capital outlay to purchase the equipment and to train the clinical staff for doing the screening and doing the, doing the imaging. And it's estimated to be up to $125,000, which is significant for uh, middle-income countries where the biggest burden of disease is. Uh, it's hopeful that some of the newer cameras like the Screen Neo, will be more um, affordable and, and, and will uh, lead to more of these machines being available. Also, when you look at the AI, artificial intelligence screening, certain algorithms are only validated for use with particular brands and models of imaging devices. So even if you get the cheaper model, then you may not be able to use AI. AI, um, some of the models that currently are available and have been validated, um, show some variation in the classification of the disease. So uh, ROP AI and IROP DL focus on the detection of PLUS disease in particular. So it's one of the more simpler ones. But there are others that look specifically at criteria from the EPROP staging. DEEPROP uses criteria that are not strictly according to the EPROP, staging, but they divide it into minor and severe, and the minor follow the ECROP uh, staging 1, 2, and zone 1, 2, so probably a disease that's not necessarily needs treatment, and then severe, which corresponds to type 1 and 2, or aggressive ROP, or stage 4 or 5 ROP. These all do demonstrate comparable sensitivity and specificity to other implemented screening techniques, but despite this, these systems uh, have so far been uh, seen limited implementation in real-world settings. So from the same article by Tan et al. in the Saudi Journal of Ophthalmology of last year, they come up with this uh, flowchart of what the ideal ROP screening should be, and that you start off with uh, an infant that's identified according to screening criteria in your country, this infant is then taken for retinal imaging, and the images are uploaded and shared on a database. If you have artificial intelligence, that's great, because the, the first screening is done by artificial intelligence, and if ROP is suspected, the images are then verified or looked uh, seen by an expert ophthalmology. If there is no artificial intelligence available, the images are directly uh, sent to an expert ophthalmologist, who then obviously looks at the images, decides that there is ROP that needs treatment according to the guidelines, or there is no ROP and the, and the child can be discharged. So would South Africa ever get to this ideal scenario? I think so, yes. I think both in the public and private sector, in the next few years, we will start seeing more teleophthalmology ROP screening. But certain criteria probably first need to be fulfilled. In the public sector, I think 
It will happen when imaging systems become less expensive, more mobile, and when enough uh, technicians can be trained and employed to capture images uh, on a full-time basis. So you have one technician who can then travel to multiple sites and, and do a good job, upload the images to either then be uh, graded by artificial intelligence first, if possible, but these models will then also have to be more refined and become useful in all infants, even those with darker fundi, and with all imaging uh, systems, even those that are much cheaper. So I do believe that in the coming years, this will probably start being rolled out in South Africa. In the private sector, I, I believe it might actually be coming sooner. And the reason I think it might be coming sooner is specifically for this reason where the pediatric ophthalmologists have decided that this is not worth their while to do screening. It's actually costing them uh, and they, it's a stressful thing for them to do and not being remunerated for it and paying very high insurance levies. So in, because of the shortage of screening personnel in the private sector, Various N NICUs will, in the near future, be purchasing these um, imaging uh, equipment themselves and training the theatre of the ICU nurses to do the imaging and probably then send the images to a pediatric ophthalmologist to grade. So I'm looking forward to the future where we will hopefully be doing teleophthalmology screening for ROP. I thank you. Thank you very much and thank you Linda for sharing that experience it was um it's good to good to hear and actually it's really comprehensive I was thinking of the questions for after your talk but you actually answered it you went through everything so well <laughs> and answered actually everything so well like about what will be needed for like you know for South Africa to kind of take the next steps into sort of telemedicine screening and all of that um how close, I mean, you mentioned a bit that the private sector might be closer than the public, but you know that now, of course, we're getting to that stage, and I think um, Paul knows more, more, and, and I know more about this than me even, is that, you know, the, we've got lower and lower cost cameras coming out all the time, and then we've also got these more and more the kind of the AI algorithms being tested and shown to be working in different settings. So um, do, you, do you think maybe in, like that kind of public sector could also be coming quite closer, or do you think there though there's the motivation there, the kind of drive or advocacy for that to happen? Um, as I say, I'm hopeful it will be if we have cheaper machines. The, the problem in the public sector is it's, it's very much cost driven. So if if the uh, equipment costs a lot and and, it, and the yield that you get from it is not great, then you're probably not going to get those those machines. And you don't want to take a very expensive machine on on the road to ten different hospitals every day where it's liable or at risk of, of breaking down, et cetera. So you, but I've looked at some of the, the machines like the Forest, which is a much smaller, very mobile machine. You can put it in a suitcase and go, and it's probably as well protected in the suitcase, not gonna break on the way. So I think if one can get those at a reasonably very cheaper, much cheaper cost, and you get someone in a car that drives from, you know, one hospital to the next, they can do 10, 10 NICUs per day, and, and, and look at all those babies, then I think it will become it will become worth it, it will become beneficial. Currently, it's so easy for the doctors to, with indirect ophthalmoscopy, because they do it really quickly nowadays, to screen 30 babies in the morning, one doctor, 30 babies. You're not going to get that with photography at this point. You know, it's going to take one technician much longer to screen 30 babies, and that's only part of it. Then it still needs to upload, be uploaded, sent, still needs to be looked at by someone else. So there's a lot more hours and a lot more people used, used to get to the same answer. And if your, if your photos are not great and 20% of them you can't actually see, you still have to go and see those 20% of babies in the hospital face to face. So at the moment, I don't think it's cost effective and worth doing in the state. But yes, if, if, we, get, if we get really good technicians who can do a lot on a day, it will become more cost effective. But I think, as I've just said, in the private sector, I can see there's already um, possibly a move towards some of these um, NICUs buying the machines because they are they cannot actually find trained 
private ophthalmologist willing to do it because of the, the medical legal issue. Um, uh, but what Paul said earlier in South Africa, I think we will never get the grading done only by uh, AI or by non medical people because of the medical legal issue. Someone has to take responsibility of making that diagnosis. And that's the person who's going to be taken to court if it's a wrong diagnosis. So it's not going to be AI. So AI can be a, a quick screen to, if, they, if you're 100% sure this is definitely not going to, not a problem baby, but you know, so if they can say, yes, it's a problem, look at it or no, it's not a problem, you don't have to look at it, but there's still going to be human screening uh, looking at, at, at the photography or at the photos, but the, the AI can help to make the numbers smaller. Yeah, yeah, and, that's, and I think that is the first step, isn't it? Is the AI screening is there to do screen out the ones that are clearly normal uh, and reduce that time of like, ophthalmologists and you know, ophthalmologists going to see babies which are kind of normal. I mean, it's a funny, I think in South Africa, you're in that kind of balance between the sort of high income and the you know, middle income sort of thing. Because like somewhere where there's more ophthalmologists, like in the UK as well, it's like seeing babies, quick to see babies by indirect, you know, for us to then move to um, a camera is, takes longer as well as the cost to ask factor but then I think we're going to hear from Adam then I think that's the model that you were talking about oh how can we take them like the forest in a suitcase into lots of different testing that's exactly what I'm going to talk about right now um how they've made that work <laughs> and made that cost effective so um yeah I mean I don't know if you wanted to add anything just now Adam, about that or you can or he's gone he's gone into screen sharing <laughs> Yeah, but um, is there any other questions for um, Linda at this stage? Moin, is there something you wanted to add right now? I think uh, the answers have been rightly answered. I think uh, let's hear from Anand. We're running out of time because we have to run another session. And okay. 10 minutes, yeah. okay, let's go straight to Anand. That, thank you, Linda. Thank very you. Much. That was great. And I really enjoyed hearing about the South Africa experience. Thank you, Aisha. And thank you, uh, Dr. Moin, for this opportunity. Um, I'll just delve directly into uh, what we've been doing for the past 15, 16 years uh, in telemedicine and ROP. I think the necessity is the mother of invention. We have three and a half million babies born preterm, less than 150 ROP specialists. It's estimated that 200,000 babies require treatment every year. So clearly it's a demand a supply issue. And I think the best way to uh, you know, bridge that was try to replace the so-called gold standard of using indirect ophthalmoscopy, which very few ROP specialists are doing, uh, with wide field imaging. And we took that one step further and we said, can we have technicians both being trained to image and grade? And I'll just tell you the evolution. So this has been around now from 2007. Uh, we worked with public and private hospitals uh, we have committed to do free ROP screening and treatment in all public hospitals in the state of Karnataka, uh, which houses roughly about 65 million. Uh, that's the population of the state. This video may be a little slow on your screen, but uh, this is a 15-year-old slide. That's when we used to take the red cam shuttle. So um, yes, it, it may be looking like a challenge of taking uh, relatively expensive equipment down on the roads, but believe me, we've, we have not very comfortable roads uh, in rural areas in Karnataka, even 15 years back. Uh, but we've been taking this very successfully, and I think it's uh, fairly robust. Of course, the, the newer camera is even better. Uh, so these go into the NICU, these trained technicians, images, take these images. We've taught them how to do the initial triage grading and then upload it onto a system. And that on the down right was the uh, very first iPhone. So we've had this ability to look at it on the go. And uh, well, yes, it was the first telemedicine program anywhere in the world to use non-physicians to screen and triage. Uh, it took us a long time to actually validate the program uh, and validate the process, but I think we have it right now. Uh, the turnaround time is less than 20 minutes. So even though we have, and this paper in JAMA looks at the low internet speeds in some of the rural areas and how we are still able to get back with a good turnaround time. Uh, fortunately, uh, and this was not the first ROP screening guidelines, there was one in 2010, but this was the one, the National Operational Guidelines, uh, which I think is we are probably the first country to allow uh, non-ophthalmologists, non-ROP specialists, and you can see that there, 
uh, train technicians to, to use the camera. And I think this was a very landmark step. This has subsequently been followed in other neighboring countries of India as well. There are a few caveats on that uh, screening guideline, that one, two, three, four rule. At least in India, we say two kilos or less than uh, 34 weeks, uh, and certainly the first screening before 30 days of life. Uh, and then uh, where it is possible, we can even do the treatment through the incubator wall. Uh, this video is to show you that it can be done through a scratched uh, NICO wall. So I think, you know, convincing the neonatologist that it should not delay uh, the screening is, is really important. These are the cards that we give out to the parents. And of course, we maintain uh, all of the data online because it's uh, imaging based. And this is roughly to show you how we have developed the process of training anyone, any technician or any uh, anyone who's going to take the images to go through this process. So when they look at an image, they either decide it's green, orange, or red uh, based on their findings. And you can see the ora serrata on the lower left, uh, where, of course, these are images on the, on the red cam, uh, subsequently on the neo as well. So subtler diagnosis of, let's say, a very subtle stage one in zone three, which you and I may miss on indirect is, is definitely picked up on, a, on imaging devices. Um, and then as you can see here, their ability to decide whether a baby can be discharged, which is green, needs follow-up, which is orange, or possibly needs treatment, or at least the specialist should see, uh, would be marked as red. And, and these are uh, the, this is the system that we've validated and we've trained scores of people across several countries now. And I think it seems to work uh, with, of course, a lot of safeguards that we've thrown in. Uh, as rightly said, uh, the, the problem of scaling this up was the cost of the red cam. Uh, so we went into a sort of an academic partnership with Forest. They are a Bangalore-based company, the same city where I am in. Uh, and this is, of course, you've seen it. Uh, this has now got an FDA approval. It has plenty of installations in several, you know, many countries. But this is wide field. And they have now an HD model, which has an angiogram unit. There are some limitations in the, in the resolution there, but it still does a very good uh, field. Uh, this was our uh, publication comparing the RedCam and the NEO. Now, uh, we've tried to introduce a few new systems in trying to expand and, and sort of scale up this program. Uh, for, for one, we have an online training program, uh, partly started before the COVID pandemic. This is how the traditional uh, training happens uh, when they come and work on mannequins, then hand-holding on live babies, and then subsequently uh, in the NICU itself. But we've been able to cut short this training program anywhere between 10 and 15 days, and the rest of the training can happen with our resource people sitting here. And, and you know, these are two male nurses in a peripheral center where they have trained a little bit, but their technique is getting refined by our online uh, web portals and video calls. And I think this has allowed us to sort of screen, you know, in an expanded modality. Of course, uh, a camera can do so much more than just taking, uh, you know, uh, uh, ROP photos, as Dr. Muchai said, that, you know, retinoblastoma. So here was a publication where we picked up so many other conditions. And, and, and now, in fact, uh, you know, we are using cameras uh, to do universal screening. And this is one of the mandates of the Indian government. This is slower to pick up. Uh, in uh, than the, on the ROP program, but it's still in you know, a work in progress. And this is one of our publications where we found that even through the lockdowns or through COVID pandemic, when literally there was no uh, you know uh, traffic on the road, we were able to continue the screening program and prevented blindness all around uh, all those 18 months when we had different forms uh, of uh, lockdowns. Uh, very rightly, as uh, Dr. Linda said, medical legal aspects are a problem, and they so are here as well. This is a very large, the largest compensation ever in 2015. There are 11 cases now, all against the neonatologist, one of them against the ophthalmologist as well. And if more than ever, imaging now has become a cornerstone. If it's it's not running away from the program, it's it's actually increasing uh, us. Uh, it's helping us to actually overcome that program, and we highlighted that in that publication. Where do we see the road going forward? And I think uh, this was a recent Lancet paper and two of neonatologists from Australia are the other authors. What we looked at is there's a very successful polio eradication program in India, probably our most successful infectious disease prevention program. And what, you know, what lessons can we learn from there? So if you look at the stuff on the right, uh, the, the stuff written in black is what we've kind of already set out to do. And, and, and the red, uh, font is where we need to still work on. Uh, you need a brand ambassador. 
you know, you need to have adoption of these guidelines. We now have a guidelines not really adopted. How do we expand to other states? And, and you know, how do you have every case that is screened or missed reported? And how do you have an independent monetary body? These are some of the things that we really need to look at. Uh, the exciting field of ROP, and these are two pro projects that I work on here in India. One is we are able to now take the tears of these babies and in our labs, uh, able to predict uh, some of these are, uh, you know, these are the markers. Of course, they're pro-angiogenic, but there's also the family of inflammatory uh, molecules and adhesion molecules. Uh, this was our first publication. We, are, we now use, um, we, we now have the ability to look at the the, what what we find in the tiers in the very first screening, and then uh, accurate, fairly accurately predict whether these babies are going to have disease going forward. These are our subsequent publications. Uh, more, in fact, both these came out this year. One looks at the inflammatory aspects, and the other one actually looks at vitamin D and then its role in possibly you know uh, preventing or modulating the disease very early on. AI, yes, we've been working on this now for over a decade, but initially it was just image processing. But now we've gone a step further. As some of our, our publications have shown, uh, we now have the ability to sort of automatically do a binary classification. It goes through the algorithm that we've developed uh, and, it, and, the, and the algorithm tells you whether there's disease or no disease. Uh, this is just an example of uh, the algorithm telling you that there is stage two vis-a-vis uh, -vis a stage three or no ROP at all. Currently, the accuracy is about in the early 90s. It's good, but not awesome. And I think there's a lot of more work to be done. This is our uh, the most recent publication this year uh, where we looked at uh, it and how we can actually detect it in, in a sort of a semi-live scenario and also use AI to, to train people. Um, the impact, and I think this is so important when you're talking to policy makers and the governments and other hospitals. So we started off with three hospitals. We are 152 right now, uh, more than 250,000 sessions, about 78,000 babies, unique babies, and over 4,000 babies treated. We have uh, almost proliferated across the country in several states, and several countries have come here, observed, and sort of modeled it partially, And but all of them have the local challenges that you spoke about. But I think the impact, the return on investment is the uh, sort of the, the blind person years that you can prevent. We ourselves have prevented, uh, you know, and that's a slide here, we have prevented around 360 million US dollars of blindness. And this is an older slide when we had treated about uh, 3,000 and odd babies. And just expanding in a few states in India, we can prevent 100 million US dollars of blindness annually. And that's really uh, the impact that you can make. Um, I'd like to thank. Uh, I'd like to end with uh, thanking all our collaborators, beginning with Government of India and all other universities, both in India and abroad. But I think I stuck to my ten-minute timing. Thank you, Aisha. <laughs> you did brilliantly, and and thank you and very you much. Your thank talk, you it's like absolutely fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to listen to Anand. He's he's done. Oh, I think the pleasure. most work out of after Paul, and you're both head to head with what you do. One is in, in the west, and one is in the east. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Shall I go ahead? Yes, we... right. So mine is going to be a shorter talk, so probably might be ending slightly in lesser time. Is telemedicine, I think it's uh, over the few talks which we've learned, which we've listened to, we've uh, found out that telemedicine can be problematic. It can be slower in places if the training of, uh, if the, training of the person who's doing the the screening is not as good as a person who's doing an indirect ophthalmoscopy. So in Pakistan, telemedicine experience, we haven't uh, have had telemedicine uh, being being practiced a lot in Pakistan. So we, I was working with Aisha we, and we're working with uh, Paul Chen and we're working on how to get this telemedicine experience started. So we're working as a timeline. So this is the time when we finally were able to start the telemedicine screening. So it is our initial experience and in doing it and uh, we'll get the results of what we have and uh, how we got there later on. But we'll just experience why we were starting to uh, on telemedicine is because of the burden of the disease our population premature birth rate is fourth in the world. There's 6 million births per year and the prematurity rate is 20%, fourth in the world. And screening in 2012 was in two hospitals. And now we expanded on to more than 20 or 25 hospitals. So out of 5% of all premature children born 35 weeks or less can go blind. 
And uh, so if that much is the percent of the blindness, technically, this much amount of babies can go blind. But in the real sense, probably, I think it's uh, less compared to what it is. And we'll find that out by getting our multi-center data from across Pakistan. But the thing is, if you've got this much of a burden, you cannot probably run it directly using indirect screening in all those centers. You need more uh, centers like Anand was mentioning to get them on telemedicine, getting help from either ophthalmic technicians or nurses to get the system started. So we started off uh, uh, the, the um, awareness of ROP and, and the human resource <laughs> development and training by Propera, Pakistan ROP and Educational Alliance. And I think uh, we have to thank Claire Gilbert and Graham uh, Quinn for being our mentors for starting this program and then running it successfully. I think we've uh, forgot the picture of Omar Mia. He's from Montefiore uh, Medical Center in New York in Albert Einstein University. So it was his idea along with the mentors that we need to have multiple NICUs. We need to have a citywide coordinator uh, collect the data centrally and then um, sort of uh, publish data and get uh, monitor the data, what we are getting. Just an overview of how many people we, I was initially at Lahore General Hospital for the last 10 years. And over the last five years, we were able to <clears throat> screen about 1,500 babies out of 3,500 babies. And we were getting a mortality rate of 45%. So uh, Lahore General Hospital and why we want ROP, then the screening criteria is a big issue for us. So for that, uh, we uh, sort of did a study on the number of blind babies, which we're seeing. And um, we were able to see that the birth, the, the screening criteria needs to be 35 weeks and 2 kg. And we're st going to start the Lahore Mobile ROP project based on uh, uh, the different studies, which... So for that, we need a camera and then a photographer. So our main aim is to get outreach centers, ROP team, and a reading center. And this is the area which we are starting first. This is Sherkpur Hospital. This is our screening team. We went there yesterday for the first time, and we were, we were able to do one uh, last week, but this was the next visit we did. We've got a telemedicine reading facility in our university, and this go kilometers um, to uh, outside the city and this is we were using the zoom platform to actually see how the screening was being done and seeing the pictures this is one test we were trying to do with the zoom but the other thing as other people was do is just get the the standard pictures so you can see the camera fits in and uh, we're using the forest camera for this thing it, it gives and we need to if you're taking the pictures you need to take five standard pictures and those will give you that the, that the patient has disease. I think the most important thing is to pick up if somebody's got plus disease. And if somebody's got plus disease, obviously that patient needs to be seen pretty early. And this is the province of Punjab. Probably we're going to be in a very small area around Lahore and where we're going to start in three or four centers in our programs. And the, the system of health centers in Pakistan is from district, is the biggest center. Then you go to Tehsil and a basic health unit. So we're going to start off with various districts. And for that, we need to collect data. So we already have our database through which we can collect data and analyze data. So whatever is being done, we can get the referrals and get them entered and uh, run them over there. You've developed... Uh, uh, patient education material we are going to give over there. We are actually uh, pasting charts on the hospital's walls, telling about ROP, what it is, and why you need to be screened for that. So in 2015, we had this many centers across Pakistan, and now we have these many centers which have increased dramatically. Uh, and I think is is not one person's job, it's everybody's commitment and, and people who are sort of joining in and sort of joining for the cause to save the babies going blind across Pakistan. And uh, we were able to publish a handbook for t training and teaching of uh, the human resource in, in our country. So it's easier to do. I'd like to th thank Claire Gilbert. She's sitting with us. That she's, uh, and Omar and Taiba and Lubna and uh, Shahid Hassan for working on this. It was a big task, but eventually we were able to do it. And in conclusion, significant progress has been made. More prog programs are involved. They're better screening, improved neonatal care, but telemedicine is the future to handle the burden of disease, which is going to be tremendous in, in the few years to come. Thank you. Okay, that's
Thank you very much, Maureen, Professor Maureen, and all, and all our panelists today. Thank you all for joining us and for um, sorry for we've been running a bit late behind today, but I think all the talks were um, incredible. So I'm just uh, delighted that we had everyone come together. Um, I don't know if there's any other final comments or questions from anybody. Um, Professor Maureen or Claire Gilbert. Yeah, thank, you, thank you very much, Aisha, for arranging this. And I think it went wonderful. And I think my battery is running low anytime, so you might just get disconnected. Okay. And... Yes, uh, yes, sure. Congratulations. For such an excellent uh, webinar, we learned a lot. Now we all know that this selling medicine is a chocolate. But the important thing for seven for provinces that how to get the red can. Because we uh, we are doing ROP screening in three four hospitals, and they are all very dedicated with genetic ophthalmologists. And we also need some support from because at least I tried hard with the different politicians and health ministers, and we now seriously need. Some support from some donor agencies. So, to guide us how to go to donor agencies. And the writing project is not an issue, we can go for it. I think Aisha can share details on how to write a project and how to do a pitch for that. I think. Yes, absolutely. Yes. But I think also um, we've got Anand and, uh, and Paul here, and they're both very experienced with cameras and different uh, lower cost cameras. So I think, of course, um, now with the RECCAM, there's so many other options now. And Anand's been using the forest. Um, Paul's developing, uh, I mean, you can speak a bit, Paul, about what you're, you're kind of developing a lower cost camera as well. So I think now there's many, many more options coming onto the market, which will make it more affordable. And that will be, I mean, we've known this for a long time, that that is going to be key. We, like there's no way that telemedicine and RP screening is ever going to be able to be scaled up with the RETCAM. Um, it has to have those lower cost cameras and mobile cameras. So um, yeah, Paul or Anand, do you want to kind of I'll, I'll let you speak because you do know more about it. Yeah, just, just a quick comment. I think, so one, Anand's doing really great work with the forest. And sorry, my kids are in the background. And I think the uh, the forest, I think, is a really great option at this point. You know, they've they've done a lot of good work, I think, over the past, you know, decade or so in trying to get better quality and and, and really addressing the need and, and the ROP space. There are going to be other systems that come out in the next, I think, five years or so. Um and I think that there's a lot of hope in that space. You know, I put in the comments box, I think ultimately what will be really interesting is that, you know, if I could predict the future, there probably will be some non-Midriatic um, options, which which will be extraordinarily game-changing. And I'm sure Anand can comment on that as well. Um, but, you know, some of the things that Pete Campbell and, and so forth, you know, he, he's been developing this, uh, one of his engineering partners, Yifan, and, and I've also been developing some more cost systems with my partner, Shen Yao. Um, it's just going to happen because we have to do it, right, to care for this community. Uh, but right now, I, I would argue that, you know, and I'm sure curious of what Anand thinks, that the forest is, is a terrific option at this point in terms of the compromise between cost and field of view and, and all the other things that we need to do. Yeah, I certainly agree. I think as of now, Forest Neo is probably the best bet. Uh, but I'm, I, I know of another camera that should be ready uh, before the next World ROP Congress, which I think is in 2024, I've been told. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's also coming out of India, and it's going to be a much smaller one, the size of like a hairdryer. And it's said to be about a half or a one third the cost of the current Neo. Um, so that's one. And yes, I, I, de I definitely agree with you about the uh, non midriatic um, A smartphone-based non midriatic camera is where we're going forward. Um, and that's also, you know, I think work in progress is not going to be very far off down the line where that's going to be a reality. Yeah, thank you, Anand. Brilliant. Um, I think... Uh... <laughs> I think they just dropped off. <laughs> You're from back and I just dropped off the entire conference, which I, I don't know if that was running on a battery. <laughs> 
but there we go. Um, maybe it's a sign. I think I'll probably just thank everyone. Say thank you so much for your time today, Paul. So early in the morning, um, I think <laughs> with your family around, Linda <laughs> from South Africa, and then and of course Mishai, who is there from Kenya. I think his engine also dropped off as well. Um, they kind of uh, just epitomise some of the challenges we sometimes face, but. Thank you all. Um, I put a, we put again uh, into the chat, just like the ROP Net website for everyone to sign up. And we will hope to hold more of these in the future. And hopefully next time it will be in February. And we will, through our emailing list, let everyone know. Um, and yeah, watch this space for what's next. But um, look forward. Like, great to connect with everyone today. And thank you again to all our panelists. So thank you. Good to see you. Thanks, Alicia. Take care. Bye, man. Bye, Linda. Bye. 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 Bye.